Axes, or uh, no, yeah, Ad Nauseam player, rather. Um, some cards that really don't line up, such as forming deck Path to Exile, not surprising to see the Ad Nauseam player take the first game. So over on your right, it's Bird. Has playing playing more or less the same list he had, but a very interesting change to, uh, to his Ad Nauseam deck. He's cut some of the utility numbers. So the main deck Slaughter Pact, uh, a Summoner's Pact, a Pentad Prism, uh, and he's playing now a full four Leyline of Sanctity in the main. Now, that's not going to be a big player in this matchup, but down the line, as we're seeing Death Shadow do so well, uh, I would expect this to be a good call for this weekend. Yeah, and you have seen with the evolution of Jund going to the Jund Death Shadow deck, they play a full main deck eight discard spells, which they're allowed to do because Death Shadow gives them such a fast and efficient clock. They're fine having a little bit more air, bad top decks in their deck, and that's why you see the main deck Leyline of Sanctity being the direction that Bird has taken his deck. Yeah, Death Shadow Jund, the big player here. We even saw last week Patrick Tilson, that was Nicholas's finals opponent, playing uh, just traditional obs on your Lingering Souls, Thoughtseize deck. Figured Leyline of Sanctity will be good there as well. Yeah, abs on cards, as uh, Patrick Sullivan uh, motioned that they should start calling the deck. I like that one. Uh, doesn't quite work as far as deck naming goes. Uh, abs on control or mid range, I suppose, is more what you would call it. And something interesting about uh, Bird's List, um, this, you started to see this a little bit more in combo decks. Uh, you see three Monastery Mentors in the sideboard. Uh, this card certainly got worse in these decks with the Banding of the Taxian Probe. Not that Ad Nauseam was playing that card, but it's a little bit slow going. I like the Mentor, though, if you expect your opponent's going to have a lot of Dispel, Spell Pierce, that kind of thing. All right, so Dubberly is going to be on the play. He's over on your left. Now, we still have some technical difficulties here, so the clock and life totals may not be moving for this game, but we'll keep you updated from here. Mm -hmm. And not to mention, when you're looking at Ad Nauseam as one of the two decks, it's really only one of the life totals that matters. That's the one on the right. Right. So Lannan Arbiter is the two drop from John. Um, this one, a lot of times, can be, it's selectively good against combo decks. Mm -hmm. Not too much shuffling going on, though. Ad Nauseam doesn't actually play fetch lands. Right. It's uh, mostly trying to take advantage of these temples here to use that scry effect to dig for his combo. There is that one mystical teachings in Bird's deck. That's going to be tough to matter in this game. So you see Bird just kind of setting up in these turns here. He didn't have a turn one Lotus Bloom. Instead, playing a temple and then turn two second temple and serum visions, really sculpting that hand, which you, this is one of the strengths of Ad Nauseam. Mm -hmm. It's allowed to just sit there for a while. When your life total starts becoming pressured, maybe use an Angel's Grace to save for a turn, uh, set up a Phyrexian on life, and then once you have access to five mana, just cast your Ad Nauseam and win the game on the spot, assuming you have on life in play, or a sixth mana to cast Angel's Grace. Ghost Quarter, the third land here from. John Dubberly, and that one is such a strong play next to Lan and Arbiter. That's a combo right there. Uh, the Ghost Quarter enables your opponent to shuffle their library, find a basic land. The Arbiter forces them to pay two to do that. Bird's tapped out. He can't. He gets Strip Mind. All right, takes two. So Bird will be down to 18. Now, that wasn't actually a free play, though, by John. He had a Blade Splicer in hand, and because that was his third turn, he really had to pick between the Ghost Quarter and the Blade Splicer. Oh, when you said it wasn't a free play, I thought you were going to say he had to put this two-mana 2-2 two -two in his deck, but that's also a very good point. <laughs> Another temple here from, Bur from Nicholas Bird, so he's just going to continue to rebuild. Goes to 16, it looks like, off an Arbiter hit, and it will be Blade Splicer added for the Death and Taxes player. And to intensify those mana issues in terms of efficiency, he does have a Sarah Avenger in hand as well. He had two white last turn, but it was only the third turn of the game. Couldn't actually cast that one. Yeah, so I think the, one of the reasons he would want to do that is that the Ad Nauseam player might actually have had two mana up on the following turn. Lots of times they don't spend their mana until turn four or five. Mm -hmm. So if he had waited, maybe the Ghost Quarter play would never happen. Right. Yeah, whenever you get an opportunity to wasteland your opponent in modern, it's probably a good opportunity. And Frexian Unlife coming off of a gemstone mine here for Bird. All right, so Frexian Unlife, a, a, an interesting card. It actually is going to function as a life gain spell here. Bird currently at 16, so when he starts taking lethal damage, he will take poison instead. You see Dab Dabberly is going to go ahead and add Windbrisk Heights to his board. And bear in mind that Phyrexian Unlife allows you to take 
more than lethal damage before you start taking poison. So let's say that bird's at three and he takes 10 damage. He actually goes to negative seven and zero poison. It's really difficult for these non-red aggressive decks to apply meaningful pressure against Unlife. They have to really get it off the table. Otherwise, they have to deal upwards of 35, 40 damage to actually win the game. Right. Swing here will be for six. That will knock Nicholas Bird down to 10 life and a pass. But there's only nine damage next turn. It's kind of a, it's really one short of what he'd like. Right. Tectonic Edge looks like the next card in hand here. The last card in hand for John. Tectonic Edge is reasonable here. As you see, Bird plays a fourth land. He does need kind of a lot of mana. There's no Lotus Blooms on Suspend. He needs to get to that threshold where he can cast Ad Nauseum. Um, he only has four lands in play. He does have Simeon Spirit Guys in the deck, but uh, if he doesn't go off this turn, this Tectonic Edge could matter. Peer through depth here from Bird. Now remember, Bird is at 10 life right now, and there's nine power in play for his opponent. So that land he played, I believe it is a fetch land. That one's not actually going to... It, it's a big cost for him to use it. Peer through depths will find a copy of Slate of Hand. So it looks like Bird's still setting up. And then he will go ahead and cast the cantrip he had found. So it looks like he's setting up for a combo next turn. Could have land. I guess, and that's pretty simple. If he has a, a black source in the deck, which he has a water grave he can get, so a fifth land and an ad nauseum should do it. Yes. That said, that tectonic edge in, jo in John's hand may, may come into play. There now are, is four lands in play for the ad nauseum player. A well-timed Tectonic Edge could keep him off that fifth land. Also remember, if that's a fetch land, land and Arbiter is actually still in play. Right. Going to take two additional mana to make that one happen. Now remember, this is game number two. The match that I started. So right now, Nicholas Bird on the right, he, he was the winner in game one. Bird's list, he only is playing two copies of Pentad, Prism, and with uh, John aggressively pressuring the mana base for him, it, it, it's actually pretty tough to get to the threshold that he needs to actually combo off. If he had a Lurus Bloom on Suspend, it's a very different situation, but now we're at the stage of the game where that's basically a dead draw. John's going to kill him before that could matter. Tectonic Edge here from John. He goes ahead and takes care of the Gemstone Mine. It only had one counter on it, but he's wanting to keep his opponent off double black. That mm -hmm. much makes sense. Right, these double Temple of Enlightenment, those don't especially matter. So he's going to attack. Now this will send John Nick down to one. And it does. Now, Burnton Forge Tender comes off from Windbrisk Kites. Three creatures did attack. Mm -hmm. The Forge Tender, it's largely coming out of the sideboard to try to deal with Lightning Storm. Bird's deck has some answers to it. Uh, out of the sideboard, he gets more as well. He has a Damnation in his sideboard, an Echoing Truth, uh, even a couple copies of Tragic Slip, which could potentially deal with that. Uh, but it is a problem that he does have to solve at some point. So with Firex and Unlife, you don't lose the game for having zero or less life. So that would mean even though he's at one, uh, Nicholas actually can use the fetch land he has in play. Something to keep in mind about Bird's configuration, there's actually no slaughter pact in a 75, uh, where you frequently you'd be able to combo off, play ad nauseum, draw your entire deck, slaughter pack the forge tender before you cast lightning storm. He does right. not have access to that. He needs more mana. So the forge tender here actually has his combo covered. He doesn't have a card like Laboratory Maniac either. Mm -hmm. So he may actually just not be able to combo through this card. He needs to solve the card first. Serum Visions and a tap land. Steam Vents, it is, for Nicholas Bird. He's at one right now. And now we're going to get an attack for 10. So it does the last point of damage to him. Then it deals nine poison. So now... Okay, so first, so yeah, so so right now he's at negative nine. So 
he was at one, that all 10 of that damage happened at the same time. So he went to negative nine. Now Nicholas is at negative nine, meaning at this point, any damage he takes will have infect. But this is kind of what you mentioned when you said this is like a 10, 15, 20 point life gain spell. Right. Though, conveniently for John, 10 points of power on the table. That's yeah, enough to kill in one turn. That is exactly what he has. Angel's Grace would not save him in this situation either. Uh, no copies of darkness in the sideboard. That's one you see sometimes as well. Right, so looking at draws, I mean, there's a sideboard damnation, it looks like, that Nicholas could have to answer this board. Uh, Echoing Truth is a possibility. He uh, does not have the black mana to currently cast damnation. He's kind of looking at Echoing Truth. You know, that, that is a steam vents there between those temples of enlightenment. So end step. It's going to be John casting Restoration Angel, uh, flickering the Blade Splicer. That's a second golem he has. There we go. This should be a lethal attack, and you were mentioning no card like Angel's Grace really matters here mm -hmm. from the Ad Nauseam Bullet deck. Once you're at zero life, that poison is just going to kill you through Angel's Grace. That's just why Infect was previously one of Ad Nauseam's very bad matchups. All right, so John Dubberly takes the, the game number two, evens things up, but they'll be heading to a deciding game number three. Now, what's something that I wonder with the Ad Nauseam deck is its fail rate. And you talk about that with these all-in decks. You know, Ad, Na Ad Nauseam is an all-in deck. It's, it needs to combo you or it loses. It doesn't have any sort of secondary plan, mm -hmm. you know. Um, the amount of disruption that Dubberly brought to the table was he, goes, he, he used a Ghost Quarter Arbiter once. And outside of that, I guess he used a Tech Edge once, but that was all the disruption he had. Mm -hmm. You know, was this kind of a fail rate game for the Ad Nauseam player, where his deck just didn't produce the combo? Yeah, he just wasn't able to produce enough mana through very minimal interaction. If he did have access to one Lotus Bloom, he would have gotten there very easily. Um, you do see Dabberly does need a couple things to go right to win games. For that game, it was that Bird was unable to produce a Lotus Bloom. And you did see some answers to that. So looking at the sideboard here for, for Dubberly is that he did he does have three copies of Stony Silence in his sideboard. And off that Windbrisk Kites, we saw at least one of them has been brought in. Yes. There's a couple of Oblivion Rings on the sideboard. There's an argument for bringing those in to deal with the Phyrexian on life. You could even use them to take care of a Pentad Prism in some spots. Stony Silence is an interesting one. It turns off Lotus Bloom and Pentad Prism as well. Mm-hmm. I think one of my favorite answers to that kind of card in John's deck are the four copies of Flicker Wisp. Uh, it, it, because it's very good at answering Phyrexian Unlife. You just remove it on the turn where they, it would be lethal. Yep. And I love it as an answer to Pentad Prism. Right. Uh, when it comes back, there was no mana spent on it. No counters added. But if you're unfamiliar with the Death and Taxes deck right now in Modern, uh, a slew of four of here. So the big ones are, you, you talk about the hate bears in the deck, right? Thalia, Guardian of Thraben, and Lane and Arbiter, both four ofs. Outside of that, he has Flicker Wisp, Blade Splicer, Restoration Angel, and Thraben Inspector as the four ofs. These are all really interesting cards. They, they have a high threshold of toughness for Restoration Angel. Blaze Splicer generates two bodies. So these line up fairly well against the three color kind of good stuff decks. The Grixis's, the Juns, just trying to one for one all your creatures. Favorite Inspector as well. They're not at their best in this matchup where they just attack for a reasonable rate. They're not really above the curve in that regard. Right, so the, the two drop only hits for two, the three drop only hits for three, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Even the three drop hitting for four, that's, that's only okay against a combo deck. Sure. A lot of times in Legacy, was it when you're playing mono white, you don't get to be too much above the curve on damage, right? Right. Um, I suppose Mirror and Crusader, sometimes we'll see them play that card. If they have Honor of the Pure, you can sneak in extra damage, but when you're playing white cards, you're mainly, you know, your creatures attack for about as much as their mana cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, largely these kind of hate bear strategies are planning on their disruptive elements lining up correctly with what the opponent is up to. That's what you saw in the game that we just covered. A couple Wasteland-esque effects were pretty good against the hand without any Lotus Blooms. Yeah, I mean, and certainly when they line up, this deck can be powerful. I can say, you know, as someone who plays a lot of green-red Valakut, uh, Land and Arbiter is a very difficult card when, it, when it's good. Right. <laughs> when you're able to just play it and then crack your Ghost Quarter on the same turn, frequently it will be that Strip Mine effect. Sure, and then you, you can get your opponents, if you can make that play, sometimes 
they're caught with all fetch lands in their hand, and you can actually really lock them out of the game. Mm -hmm. Now, how does this, and this, I guess we're going to come back to this a lot, uh, this question in the weekend. Uh, when we have these Death Shadow decks r running around everywhere, how do you think Death and Taxes stacks up against that sort of strategy? I think this is going to be one of a Death and Taxes worst matchups, these spell-based combo decks. Uh, particularly one that's leaner on fetch lands. Let's say the combo sure. deck is something like Valakut, Titan, Scapeshift. That's where your Leon and Arbiter is very yeah. good on its own. Uh, this is not necessarily one of those matchups. There's very few shuffle effects in the Ad Nauseam deck. The creatures aren't good enough on rates to really beat up combo decks with uh, the kind of efficiency that you need in the modern format. Your path to exiles are pretty worthless. Um, yeah, so is the reason to play this then the fair decks, like the, the Death Shadow Jund, perhaps? That's largely the idea. Four Path to Exile certainly matters a lot more against that deck. A mulligan here from John Dubberly for the third game. He will be on the draw. And looks like has kept on six. Reasonable hand. Looks like he has two lands, four creatures. The hard thing about this is that when you're looking, look, imagine when John is looking at his hands, it's all about how fast he can deal damage. The idea right. that he can just, you know, you mentioned against how against Val could, they can almost lock their opponent out of the game. Uh, I don't think he's going to be able to do that against an ad nauseum player. This is very much not a matchup where he can just keep a lands and spells hand. He needs to look at how these things line up against a stack that's really not playing the same game. Well, one thing, Dodge, there's no Lotus Bloom from Bird as we're underway with game three. Bird starts on a temple and then goes into Slate of Hand. So going to try to build up to five mana the fair way. <laughs> if he was able to find a Lotus Bloom on turn two, that's usually going to be good enough in a matchup like this. Yeah, after that, you're scrying them to the bottom, though? I would imagine so. A really powerful card, but a short window for it to be good. And we do see Leon and Arbiter making another appearance. It'll join Thraben and Spectre. And Nicholas Bird down to 19. It's entirely possible that as an ad nauseum player, you move away from Lotus Bloom when you suspect that your opponent will have Stony Silence. Now, something interesting is going to play out here. So uh, John has shown that he has Leon and Arbiter with his two drop. And John also has a Ghost Quarter in hand. What I'm wondering is whether or not Nicholas is going to have the heads upness to leave up two mana here. Mm -hmm. If he does, then that Ghost Quarter play doesn't really do anything. It will prevent Bird from doing something like tapping low for a Phyrexian Unlife in the coming turns. Yeah, but see, this is so smart. For the basic Swamp, uh, we see a draw here from John. But right now, Ghost Quarter yeah, doesn't really feel like it's going to do anything. Mm -hmm. He, he can leave that Ghost Quarter up, and then it's technically half the mana necessary to crack the clue, but this is not a, a clue-cracking matchup. That's just not a resource that especially yeah. matters. I would imagine that Nick Pillis Bird would be really happy if, if his turn is crack clue, say go. Right. So John's going to add a second Thraben Inspector, getting a second clue. Swing for three will put his opponent down to 16. Yeah, and he's just going to leave up the Ghost Quarter here and crack, crack the clue if uh, he does not get the opportunity to use that, though. Imagine with Bird leaving up that two mana there. That's something he's very much cog cognizant of. I think it's interesting. He didn't make any more plays. There was a two-drop available. He has a copy of Kataki War's Wage in hand. Um, I know it's not an exciting two-drop, but it looks like instead he's left up mana to crack a clue. I'm not... I guess one of the problems is, right, if he plays Kataki, he's going to lose all his clues. Kataki plus Straven Inspector is not much of a combo. But when he's only adding one power to the board, that's a great, it's a great turn for Nicholas. So Nicholas, a fourth tap land and says go. Now that he sees the, the Ghost Quarter and Thraben and, and the Lean and Arbiter in play, I have to think he's just going to leave up mana. Mm -hmm. And Bird respecting the Ghost Quarter, that does cause him to not be able to tap low for a Phyrexian on life on that turn, but his life total is high enough where that's not really a big cost for him. Yeah, he's still at 16 right now. But he may have to make a move. As in this, on this turn, John did add some, some significant creatures to the board. So an attack for four will put the Ad Nauseam player down to 12. 
or would have in a second year. But you see, and then Sarah Avenger is added in. So there's an attack before damage. Nicholas Bird is going to fatal push the Arbiter. In response, Ghost Quarter on a land. Nicholas is going to pay two for the permission to shuffle. Then goes and gets the planes. Important to remember to pay two before you put the land in your graveyard. <laughs> yeah. I'm, um, I'm a little surprised here that John went for that Ghost Quarter play, especially into two open mana. Well, it's entirely possible that he sees this game slipping away as Bird is four lands on the battlefield, potentially looking at comboing off on the following turn. Well, well Bird got to trade what his blue-black duel for a planes. I'm not even... That might even be good for... For Nicholas. Well, what I'm getting at is that Dubberly's outs might hinge on Bird not understanding that interaction. Okay, so hoping that it didn't work. Uh, on the attack, then, it's 14 is currently the life total for our ad nauseum player. He only took the damage off the Thraben Inspectors as that Arbiter was pushed away. Pushing that Arbiter opens up the window to resolve a Mystical Teachings, my favorite Ooh. card in Bird's deck. Yeah, that is a one-up. He had it last weekend and kept it in for this one. Serum Visions for Nicholas Bird. And he's just, this is something I love when I'm in this situation as a combo player. He has so much time here. You see, he's only at 14. This is his, he's going to make his fifth land drop this turn. And so, yeah, maybe he could have a combo he could go for, but instead he can just sit back and cast cards like Serum Visions, appear through depths in his hand. He's going to Thought Seize his opponent. That's a huge show of strength. Mm -hmm. And really, Bird's primary opposition right here is his own dex fail rate. All right, we see Kataki, Stony Silence, Sarah Avenger, and Restoration Angel. Uh, the Thought Seize will put Nicholas down to 12. It's significant, right? That means an attack for five next turn. And if you add any of these creatures to the board, then it's a two-turn clock. Mm. Yeah, Deberly only with two lands on the battlefield. The Restoration Angel, very unlikely to be castable before the end of this game. Stony Silence and Kataki, well, Bird's not presenting any Ooh. artifacts here. And this is, a, this is something dangerous. Uh, Bird did not make a land drop, and then his opponent drew Tectonic Edge. So he'll peer through depths in response, but he's actually quite low on mana. Mm -hmm. It's going to take some Simeon Spirit Guides to uh, yeah. go off this game. Peer Through Depths finds a copy of Ad Nauseam, but now Nicholas Bird down to three lands. He takes a hit here, goes to seven. Now, because his opponent used Tectonic Edge, he's not presenting lethal next turn. Nicholas is at seven, and there's five power on the board. He'd have to draw a copy of Honor the Pure to present lethal. But if he gets his opponent down to two, the card ad nauseum, that doesn't really do anything. Right. Not without Angel's Grace. Right. Rarely does it. I suppose, <laughs> yeah, I suppose in this matchup, it's always, it always needs one of those effects. Right. Not, being a, not having the Frexian on life on this turn could be huge, though. Draw for the turn is another copy of Lean and Arbiter here for Dubberly. Does not have lethal. Yeah, the Arbiter, Arbiter not too likely to matter in this spot. Instead, he's going to add Stony Silence onto the board. That own, His own clue, never to be cracked. But he'll put <laughs> his opponent down to two on the attack. So this is going to force some action on Bird's side. Our champion from last week, he does have a copy of Angel's Grace and Ad Nauseam in hand. One Simian Spirit Guide would work. Or how about this? Damnation. That's a good one. <laughs> Destroys all creatures. No lands. He just says go. So when he does, I'm looking at his hand. Looks like he does have a copy of Simeon Spirit Guide, Angel's Grace, and Ad Nauseum. So he needs to draw a land here. If he has the land, this looks pretty good. If not, he can put Simeon Spirit Guide in front of this Leonin Arbiter. Well, he just tapped his red source, so yeah, that one's off events. the table. Tapped for Serum Visions. So it looks like he, maybe he has a card, if he has a card like Phyrexian Unlife, Sure. That would also be excellent here. Well, it's tricky, right? So Nicholas Bird, our ad nauseum player on the right, is at two. So Leon and Arbiter is lethal here. Mm -hmm. Nicholas Scrying, he's got the full combo in hand. He is one mana short. It seems to me that Bird should have tapped his temple to cast that Serum Visions in case he wanted the option to cast the Spirit Guide. 
plays Urborg and says go. So I'm thinking he might have to Angel's Grace here, and Nicholas thinking the same thing. So Angel's Grace, he cannot go below one this turn and cannot lose the game this turn. With the exception, if Bird has a second Angel's Grace in hand, well, this is pretty much rolled up. Yeah, then, then it's very safe. And, you know, he did scry a card to the top with Seer and Visions, which that's a huge tell that he has the combo next turn. I mean, if he didn't, he'd put both cards to the bottom. One would assume. And a draw here. Simeon Spirit Guide ad nauseum in response, Angel's Grace. Here we go. And not even going to make him go through it. It's an offer of the hand from John Dubberly. So, defending champion Nicholas Bird, he was your Indianapolis winner last weekend. He's going to start today off on the right foot as well, winning round one. Yeah, top.